All right, welcome back to chapter 12, scene size up. Our overview is going to be violence towards EMS personnel, take the necessary standard precautions and other personal protection uh, precautions, determine the scene safety, determining the nature of the pro problem, and determining the number of patients. Our case study intro, dispatcher Sherry Jackson speaks into the radio, ambulance 5, rescue 7, respond to the Water Street Saloon. 221 West Water Street for an injured person. Law enforcement is en route. EMTs Chantel Barclay and Del, Ra Del Rains glance at each other and head toward the ambulance. What are some specific concerns about this call that the crew should keep in mind? What clues should the crew be alert to in order to maintain their own safety? What actions are necessary in order for the crew to remain out of harm's way? Remember, I encourage you to pause this video and write these questions down so that you can answer them in the future. Okay, our introduction. Pre-hospital setting is an uncontrolled environment. Failing to recognize the hazards of a scene is uh, has a high cost. You must pay close attention to the scene size up on every call. Scene safety is dynamic and an ongoing pro uh, process. It is very dynamic. It means it is very, very in your face all the time and it always has to happen it's ongoing it never in it, it, scene safety doesn't happen one time and then you forget about it the scene can a safe scene can become unsafe very very quick scene size up has three basic goals identify hazards that means to yourself and your partner determine the nature of the problem and recognize the need for additional resources Evaluate the following components in a stepwise manner. Take the necessary standard precautions, that is your personal protective equipment and your body substance isolation. Um, could, that could be uh, a, a reflective vest during a motor vehicle crash. Uh, evaluate the scene for safety hazards. Determine the mechanism of injury or the nature of illness. Determine the number of patients and determine the need for additional resources. You will uh, see that several times within this class okay violence towards ems personnel must be a constant consideration in your scene size up and the safety precautions violence towards ems personnel is common in the pre-hospital environment in a recent study published in pre-hospital emergency care the authors found that 69 percent of the ems personnel studied had experienced some form of violence over the preceding 12 months 69% is a big number when it comes to a 12-month time frame and the topic that we're dealing with, and that's violence towards EMS personnel. Uh, standard precautions and other personal protection cost precautions. Personal protective equipment, or PPE, ranges from examination gloves to complex breathing apparatus, helmets, and other gear. Do not use PPE you have not been trained to use. Um, I know that some of us want to be the hero and we pull up at a scene where there's a fire, an active fire, and there's possibly people inside and the fire department suiting up their respirators and you want to go help and they have an extra respirator and you haven't been trained on that respirator, please do not put that respirator on and go in that fire. It's not that you're not able it's just that if that machine if that piece of equipment fails and you don't know how to um, get it out of fail mode or do what you got to do to get it off and get out then it could possibly kill you use the same level PPE uh, being used by other personnel such as firefighters or factory workers where you are um, and this means that um, it also goes back to your training if you are the fire department there with all their little handy dandy tools and um, breathing apparatuses and things like that and you haven't been if you haven't been trained to, to use those then you need to stay away from that area <clears throat> firefighters wear full protective um, gear at the scene of a motor vehicle crash in case it catches fire those are fire retardant or fire proof um, suits all right scene safety determining scene safety Scene safety is an assessment of a scene to ensure the well-being of the EMTs, patient, and bystanders. Ensuring scene safety is a dynamic and ongoing process. Scene safety requires EMTs to exercise leadership and take control of the scene. 
Look at that statement again. To exercise leadership and take control of the scene. Consider your dispatch information. Dispatch information can help you anticipate uh, safety needs, but is only a starting point. Just because the dispatcher got uh, certain things from the call taker who got certain things from the caller doesn't mean things won't change by the time you get there, get worse, get better. Um, additional things happen, additional patients, that sort of thing. You get there and you're like, wait a minute. I thought this was just a patient with toe pain and now it's cardiac arrest and uh, somebody's finger's been cut off and who knows what else. Even routine sounding uh, dispatches can lead to dangerous scenes. That's very true. Scenes are very dynamic and they, the safety of them change quickly. Some hazards include angry or hostile patients or bystanders, hazardous materials, infectious disease, crime scenes, and downed power lines. Consider the need for additional or specialized resources. Some scenes involve situations that require resources and training beyond that of EMTs. Uh, prime example are firefighters who are trained to use jaws of life and things like that to open cars and extricate people. Um, we will not learn how to do that in this class, um, but they are, uh, I wouldn't say more highly trained than you, but they've been trained in those resources. Um, examples include hazardous materials, extrication, water rescue, and high angle rescue. Here's a picture of some downed electrical wires that pose a threat to the EMT. Um, I'm going to tell you right now that, that I guarantee you they didn't, get on, they didn't get on that car until the power company came and turned the power off to that section because everybody would ha take a high risk of being electrocuted right here. And if you notice law enforcement, they're over there doing their thing, keep people away from the scene, blocking traffic. Um, and you have EMS right here. She's standing back there. She's not trained to use those tools to get those people out. So she's letting the people who are trained do it and so that she can access her patient. <sighs> Consider scene characteristics. EME, EMT safety is of primary importance. EMT safety is of primary importance. Your safety is first and foremost, first and foremost. An injured EMT cannot provide emergency care because now you are a patient. If you are injured, you are a patient. You no longer act as an EMT, uh, depending on your injury. Resources may be diverted from the patient to the injured EMT. I'm going to tell you right now, if my, any of my crew get hurt on scene, I'm going to make sure that they're okay first. Okay, I got their back first. Do not enter unstable crash scenes. you got to wait for the fire department to get in there and stabilize the vehicle because, God forbid, you walk up there and you're trying to climb on top of a vehicle that's on its side to get, a, get to the patient and just your little bit of body weight uh, sways it one way and the car comes crashing down on both you and the patient. Managing patients on roadways places uh, EMTs at an extreme risk. Um, we all know the term rubberneckers and we've seen rubberneckers and we know that other crashes can occur. Uh, as a rubbernecker is passing one crash, they're looking over not paying attention and boom, they get in a crash too. So um, it's like whenever you put on flashy lights and sirens and stuff like that, it's like a bug zapper. People are just drawn to it. You know, Ooh, look at that. What's going on? Oh, my goodness. Because no matter what they say, they want to see somebody's arm cut off or somebody's head broken open and stuff like that. They want to get all the good details, see if it's their family member or something like that over there so they can go home and gossip about it. So that's why people rubberneck. The next thing you know, they're either causing their own crash and they, or they're not paying attention. They run into you or the fire department or what, whatever. Okay, uh, wait for police to enter a crime scene or other volatile scenes. Retreat if the scene becomes unstable. So crime scenes, uh, any scene that involves um, uh, perpetrators, suspects, assaults, violence, that sort of thing. Uh, we're going to wait for the police to call us. Psych patients, we're going to wait for the police to call us and say, hey, the scene is safe. You can come in. It doesn't mean you're weak or stupid or anything like that. It just means that they have cooler tools than you have as far as uh, detaining someone. They got tasers and spray and handcuffs and stuff like that so they can 
uh, they can end the threat and then they can call you in to evaluate your patient. Bring your portable radio with you. God forbid you'd be out there working on a patient away from your truck and you need to call dispatch and you don't have time to pick up your cell phone because the scene just got really hostile and you really wish you had that little button you could push and start screaming for help, but it's in the truck. Uh-oh. Bring your radio with you. Call for help from the appropriate agencies. So you have to assess your scene, know what you're dealing with. Do you need hazmat? Do you need fire? Do you need police? That sort of thing. Remove yourself if a scene becomes uh, hazardous or unsafe. And if, you know, you're on scene and you have an assault or something like that, and the perpetrator shows back up, you know, and the patient's like, that's who did it right there. And it's like, hey, let's all get out of here and contact law enforcement so that we don't become victims as well. Okay, crash scenes. Hazards from the crash and from traffic must be controlled. Is the vehicle stable? If not, can you safely make it uh, stable? Or are additional personnel and equipment necessary? Um, are power lines involved? Now, I'm going to tell you this, that um, going back to that second bullet about the stable vehicle, this is southeast Louisiana or just, in just the south period. You know, there's so many firefighters and volunteer firemen around it's crazy we need them i'm thankful for them but i'm almost positive unless you are right around the corner that you or you witness the crash that you're not going to be the first one there okay that fire department is going to be, be there and they're already going to assess their situation stabilize that vehicle and once they get that done and the vehicle maybe the vehicle needs to be cut open or whatever, and they're gonna sit. They're gonna be sitting there looking at you, waiting, waiting for you to get there, so you can adjust your patient. Because they only, they're only uh, trained a little bit in medical response. So, um, you know, as far as everything else, they're gonna wait for you to get there. That's their protocol. Um, are power lines involved? If power lines are involved, folks, please, 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 don't be a hero and be like, "Well, those power lines, they're down, but they're not touching the car." Um, but they are on the ground, you know, and you walk over there and the ground's charged. And the next thing you know, you're, you're the next crispy critter. Okay. Um, please don't do that because, um, you just, you just don't, I mean, if, especially if the patient's in there and they're sitting in the car and they're fine and everything's okay. Wait for the power company to get there. Um, I will tell you that power companies have a protocol to where if not, if, um, emergency services like EMTs and or EMS and fire and police call for them they drop what they're doing as soon as possible and they come to that scene and um, they deal with that first because they know that it's a, a time sensitive and um, you know they're supposed to I mean they're just going to dispatch the closest person to it so you got to be patient man you know it's like whenever somebody whenever if you're ever in a crash or something like that or you needed fire police and EMS you know you called and, and you just had to be patient wait for them to get there. You know, I mean, it, it is what it is. You know, can't twi uh, wiggle our nose and they, you know, pop up in front of us. That would be nice, but it doesn't happen that way. Okay, scene characteristics. All right, so we have this car hit a pole, broke the pole in half. See those power lines are dangling. They're not on the ground, but at any moment, that power line, that pole could break. And those lines could fall right on top of you. And I guarantee you those lines are charged. So um, that's why you want to wait for the power company. They'd come flip a fuse or something like that, cut the power off to that pole, and then you can go to work. Uh, hazardous materials. If you haven't been trained in hazmat, do not, please, please do not try to figure it out on your own. You know, Google is cool, but Google isn't, as cool, isn't cool enough for you to sit there and go, well, that's the placard on that. That's the chemical. And as long as we don't touch it, we'll be okay. Let's go over there and get next. No, no, no. I know we all want to help our patients and our patients might be in dire need of our attention, but if we are going to enter an unsafe situation that we are going to be patient number two or three or whatever. And we're not going to be of any good to anybody, you know, and then that's going to cause out, call out more resources and, our supervisors might have to show up at our house, knock on the door, and say, hey, you know, your loved one saw the warning signs but um, ignored them, and now they breathe in a, 
a deadly chemical and they're dead and we just don't want that okay it's, i mean I'm, not, I'm 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 being real that's you know it's happened before that's why they that's why they teach this and that's why you see those guys there with those hazmat suits on and their little uh machines and everything that are dealing with it okay all right crime scenes uh do not enter a crime scene until police tell you it's okay to enter the crime scene and when you go into the crime scene, please don't disturb anything in the crime scene. Uh, when you deal with your patient, you go do to your patient. Sometimes the police may guide you in there. Please follow them. Uh, crime scenes belong to them. They are in charge of them. Um, and until you become a detective or a police officer, then that crime scene does not belong to you. You are a guest in that crime scene. The only thing that belongs to you is, you, belongs to you is the treatment of your patients. Motor vehicle crash at an overpass here. Um, obviously, that vehicle is not stable. Um, you know, you can stand back, get at a safe distance, and assess. You know, if your patient is conscious, you may be able to yell at them. Hey, look, are you, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, well, I need you to stay right there. Please do not try to get out of the vehicle. Um, you know, and somebody's going to come. We're going to stabilize the vehicle. And we're going to help you out. For a couple reasons, if they get out and the vehicle falls on them or um, or if they have like a spinal injury or something like that and they try to move and then they can't and they're paralyzed, they can fall and get hurt even worse or die. Uh, crash scenes, they are jag uh, jagged metal or broken glass is a threat. Um, are there undeployed airbags? It's an important thing because if you are treating your patient in the front driver's seat or the front seat of any car and um, no, the airbags are not deployed, and uh, all of a sudden, <laughs> your head is between the steering wheel and your patient, and the airbag deploys at 200 plus miles an hour. And if you don't believe me, you can look it up. Airbags deploy at 200 plus miles an hour. That airbag is going to push your head into your patient's face at about 200 miles an hour. And I know you don't want that to happen. Uh, is there fuel leaking? And if so, is there an ignition source by? You don't want to that fuel to hit that ignition source and cause an explosion or cause the vehicle to catch on fire. Is there fire? If there's fire, there's hazardous material, if there's fuel leaking, guess who we need to call? The fire department. Just like the fire department police would call you to put you on standby in case there's an injury, that's when you need to call them and put them on standby in case something catches fire, in case you need extrication, that sort of thing. Okay, protection from moving traffic to reduce an incidence of being struck by traffic. Wear an ANSI approved reflective vest. I will tell you that most of your ambulance company's protocol is to wear a reflective vest when you're in traffic, and it is an ANSI approved. Um, that's going to, you know, fall under OSHA guidelines and all that stuff, but um, you have to have that on so that if you do get hit, then... Um, the liability isn't as great or something like that, but um, you need to be seen, okay, especially at nighttime. Uh, and you will wear it at daytime, too. It's just the way it is, okay? Limit your time on scene to reduce exposure to traffic. Don't be sitting out there in the middle of the road 20, 30 minutes talking to your patient. Get them on the stretcher. Get them in the truck. Get them transported. Get them packaged up as quick as you can because you need to get out of there, okay? Um, shut down traffic on the roadway if necessary. Um, I will tell you that nine times out of 10 or 99.99% of the time, police and fire will be there and they will be more than happy to shut down the traffic. I'm just being honest. <clears throat> to reduce incidents of being struck by traffic, place flares or cones uh, if your truck has them. Uh, place vehicles strategically so they protect the scene and do as much work as possible out of the traffic flow. Um, I worked a crash scene where we had two patients, um, got one on the stretcher, put her in the back of the truck, and we didn't do any treatment. We asked her some questions to make sure she didn't have any spinal injury, got her on the stretcher, put her in the back of the ambulance, and that's when we started our work. That's when we did everything, like putting her on, ox put her on oxygen because her COPD acted up. Um, there was wheezing on the right side, and she had pain in her back and her legs. And we put an EKG on, started an IV, uh, blood pressure, SpO2, and all that thing. We did everything in the back of the truck because we needed to get her out of that vehicle and out of traffic. 
Don't turn your back to moving traffic. Like I said, you're like a bug zapper. People are like, ooh, what's going on over there? And if you ever think about it, whenever you're driving, if you look off to the side, before you know it, your vehicle goes that way. So your vehicle is going to go exactly where your head's going or where your head's looking. And if somebody's looking at you, nine times out of ten, their vehicle's going in that direction too. And next thing you know, you're like a bug on a windshield. Okay? So you need to be able to look at the traffic and say, uh-oh, somebody's coming, jump out of the way, okay? Don't jump highway dividers to provide emergency care for a couple of reasons. One, you might hurt yourself. Two, uh, now that divider is dividing you between your ambulance and the patient, and or you and your ambulance, so if you needed anything else, uh, then you wouldn't be able to get it. Plus, uh, I know you're not going to be throwing your patient over the divider, okay? Please get on the same side of the divider as the patient. Reduce unnecessary scene lighting that distracts or impairs visibility by traffic, like do not shine uh, flashing lights or bright lights into oncoming traffic that will blind people, um, that sort of thing, okay? If you can just turn your scene lights on, you know, without all those big spotlights and things, then that's what you need to do. All right. Uh, turn the wheels of parked emergency vehicles so that they are pointed away from the scene, so if you get rear-ended, the, the, the vehicle should go in the direction that the wheels are pointed, so if it's pointed away from the scene, it goes in that direction. Avoid stopping and standing between vehicles. Simply because if you um, stand in between a fire truck, two fire trucks, and one of them gets rear-ended, it could sandwich you between the two, and you don't want that. All right, other rescue scenes. Some rescue scenes require specialized training and equipment like chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons. Yes, we are in 2020, and we have the threats of nuclear, biological, and chemi chemical warfare. Uh, unfortunately, terrorists do exist in this uh, world. It is the world we live in, so um, we are not trained for that, but some people are. Heights. Um, know your limits. If you're scared of heights, then you need to know your limits. Uh, heights are dangerous. You know, one, one wrong step, and see you later. Natural disasters, good old southeast Louisiana. We have hurricanes and floods and tornadoes and uh, just name it, we have it. Um, underground areas, uh, I don't know if there's many, I'm sure there's not many caves in Louisiana. Underground stuff that we're going to have to deal with because we're a marshland. But um, there is that possibility if you go somewhere in another part of the country. Uh, ice rescue, definitely not in Louisiana, but um, uh, if you go to work in another part of the country, there there is a uh, possibility for ice rescue. Um, like I said, if you don't know how to do this, if you haven't been trained to do it, then don't do it. All those suits that they're wearing, stop them from getting hypothermia and freezing under that water. Moving water rescue, if you do, do not have the training, please do not do it. I mean, let's just look at this for a second. Um... Look, he looks like you got a couple of trained guys over here or whatever, and they got a ladder, an extension ladder going across. So uh, what is that, a vehicle right there? And this guy, who's probably never had any, well, no, take that back. There's a boat and there's a rocks. So this guy over here, he's probably had no water, moving water training whatsoever. He's responsible and she's responsible for holding that ladder down so it doesn't move, so that their friend doesn't fall off and get washed down the river. So, you know, I mean, I, I mean I'm mean, i not water rescue trained, so maybe maybe that is the right way. I'm not sure, but it doesn't look cool. And I sure wouldn't be on, want to be responsible for holding that ladder. Other rescue scenes collapsed, cave in, collapses in cave-ins. Uh, we can have collapses here if we deal with, um, you ever heard of a feed silo? Um, where they store feed in big, tall, cylindrical silos, and those things will collapse. You know, things can collapse on you. Uh, cave-ins. Um, more like underground stuff, but we can also have things cave in on us. I mean, it doesn't have to be necessarily a cave. Storage tanks and vats, that's, you know, silos, bins, that's what I was talking about. Silos and bins are suffocation hazards because they're sealed off and, and that the dust and everything from the feed or whatever they have in there could get in your lungs and suffocate you. Uh, farm equipment. We definitely have farm equipment in, in Louisiana, all over the country. And, um, you know, people falling off farm equipment, getting knocked out and get run over by the farm equipment. So um, 
you know, th- these are some things you're going to have to think about, you know, when you get that dispatch call. Um, unstable surfaces and slopes. Remember to secure the patient to the hillside. Be sure that the vehicles that have gone over embankments have been secured. Beware of loose rocks and stones that may be knocked down to your position. Water. Retrieving a patient from a swimming pool will be difficult and should never be attempted alone. Uh, rescue in open water is a specialized technique that requires training and equipment. Rescue in moving water is complicated because of the force of the current. Water weighs 62 pounds per square feet. So if you take one square cube of water, it weighs 62 point something pounds. And if it's moving at a high rate of speed, and a lot of it, a lot of cubes, cubic feet of water, at 62 pounds per square feet, it's going to very quickly outweigh you, and it's going to very quickly sweep you down in the direction it's moving. Toxic, sub- toxic substances in low oxygen areas, scenes such as tanker spills, pipeline ruptures, and heavy smoke conditions require specialized assistance. Confined spaces may be low in oxygen or high in toxic gases. Uh, a toxic environment can cause people within it to suffer similar symptoms. Clandestine drug operations, um, they're talking about meth labs, okay? Look for chemicals such as ephedrine, pseudoephedrine, iodine, hydrochloric acid, ether, and anhydrous ammonia. If you are not trained to make the environment safe in such situations, you must contact specialized rescue or fire units. I don't know why you'd be on the scene of a meth lab without law enforcement, but sometimes you never know. You walk into uh, a scene with a patient, you know, and all of a sudden you're looking around and you're like, whoa, that's, this looks like a meth lab. It's time to leave and notify the proper authorities. Okay, click on the item that is not a goal of the scene size up. Not a goal of the scene size up. And you'll hear my dog walking around in the background because she can't sit still. Okay, so if you chose A, getting a sample history from the patient, you are correct. The three goals of scene size up are one, to determine the safety of the scene, two, to determine the nature of the problem, and three, to determine the need for any additional resources. Okay, crime scenes. Remember that ensuring your own safety is the first step in scene size up. Wait for the police to arrive and secure the scene before you attempt to enter. If you arrive at such a scene and feel uneasy or suspect that a threat might exist, do not enter the scene. And if you find yourself on the scene, Leave the scene. Arriving at the crime scene, turn off the siren. Siren, siren. Turn off the siren and emergency lights. By arriving discreetly, you draw less attention. Uh, if you arrive at such a scene and feel uneasy or suspect that a threat might exist, do not enter the scene. Park two to three houses away. Stage where you're comfortable. Okay. This all I'm just saying. If you have a vehicle and you can drive, it'll take you seconds to get there as you wait for law enforcement. Studying the crowd. Assess the crowd. The size of the crowd is less important than its mood. Let me say that again. The size of the crowd is less important than its mood. You can have a crowd of a 1,000 people that are happy. There'll be no problems except they're taking up space. And you can have a crowd of 50, 25, 20 that are very, very angry and mad and upset. Those could pose a problem. Do not allow yourself to be pulled into chaos if present. And let me say this too. Somebody, if you're there working on a patient or something like that, your main priority is seeing safety in that patient care. If somebody is insulting you and throwing out slangs and whatever and cursing at you and yada, 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 you know, and you can ignore that, please ignore it. Please don't turn around and get pulled into that chaos because next thing you know, you're going to be fighting with somebody and then even if you win the fight, your work's going to find out. and It's just going to be really bad. You know, you could lose your job or, you know, just don't, 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 don't jump to their level, please. I'm just, I'm, I can't stress that enough. If the crowd seems hostile, retreat, you know. Um, and go to the scene and the crowd's just like going crazy and they're not letting you do your job. Get out of there. Get out of there. Don't even get in there. Um, walk on the grass, not the sidewalk, you know. <laughs> so this is my, not my favorite part of the um, 
the, the class because I don't know why you should be doing this anyway to avoid getting shot or attacked because we should not be going on a scene to where we have to do these things in order to avoid getting injured. But I'm going to teach it anyway. Walk on the grass, not the sidewalk, is to, to not make noise. Hold your flashlight beside you, not in front, because if someone shoots at it, they can shoot your flashlight out of your hand and, can hit, and it won't hit your body. Walk in a single file, I don't understand that one because I can, anyway, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, note places of concealment and covers in case you start taking rounds. You can jump behind something and hide. Look at windows and corners uh, in case somebody's sneaking up on you, looking at you through a window. Stand to the side of a door when you knock. Listen, this is not my favorite one. If you, if you have to approach a house and you're worried about getting shot through the door, you shouldn't be going to that house. You should be waiting for law enforcement to get in there and make the scene safe. I just, I just don't understand this. Um, when you're at the patient's side, your first priority remains protecting yourself and your partner. Be aware that a perpetrator may still be on the scene. Ensure that police, that the police have been called and follow local protocols. At a secure crime scene, limit the number of responders because you don't want to mess up the crime scene. Do not allow bystanders to touch or disturb. Please, that don't let them on the scene. Uh, introduce yourself to the patient carefully. The patient may be the perpetrator. Yes, that's true. You may be called to treat a patient who has just committed a heinous crime. Your your priority is patient care, not your judgment about what they did. Okay, that's for the the courts to decide. Okay, have an EMT keep watch on the area. Uh, use your task is to render uh, medical assistance. Where appropriate, assist the police. That doesn't mean get out there and do crowd control. Okay? That means if the police need help with some medical situation, that's what you're going to do. You're going to help them with that. Okay? Do not disturb any evidence. Do not touch or move suspected weapons. Wear gloves the entire time on scene. You don't want your DNA on the scene as well. Do not cut through a bullet or knife hole. Okay? Cut around it. Cut at a point away from a rope knot. So if, uh, you know, for like hangings or whatever, suicides, don't cut the knot. Cut away from it. Um, do not burden the patient with crime questions. It's not your business. Treat your patient. Uh, note who is at uh, the scene when you arrive. And here we go. Um, like I said, I mean, this is so you don't get shot in the chest. So you get shot in the hand instead, okay? I don't understand why they teach this. This is not. This is what police officers learn. I know that because I was a police officer. That's why it doesn't make sense to me. In all my years and in, in, in being a first responder, police, EMS, all that stuff, I have never seen EMS do this before ever. And I've worked with EMS a whole lot. Okay, just telling you. Okay, I. You see what I'm saying? I. I just, there should be no reason why we're sneaking up on somebody. Okay, I just. It doesn't make. Uh, it doesn't make sense. Again, the, the, the reason why you don't stand in front of the door, police officers are taught that the door is a fatal funnel. So when you knock on the door and you're like, police, and uh, next thing you know, you start catching rounds through the door. So that's why police officers stand like that and knock to the side. Usually if somebody's hurt and sick or something like that, you knock on the door and it's an EMS, ambulance, you know, um, then uh, they, they, they hopefully will let you in or the police will be there and they'll let you in. If you think it's unsafe and you don't want to get in there, you don't even want to arrive on that scene. You need to tell dispatch rolls, law enforcement out there. Let them go out there and make the scene safe. Because I'm guarantee you, the police are going to call you for every little bump, scrape, and bruise somebody gets on the scene. Good, you to come check them out. And you're going to get out there and be like, look, it's just a scrape. Why did you call me? And they're going to say, oh, well, we just want to cover our, uh, our area because uh, we don't want them to come back and say something happened. So that's why the police are going to call you out there. And they're going to call you out there for every little thing i promise you so you know what return the favor barroom scenes yes you may get called to a barroom club or something like that people consuming alcohol can make a scene volatile and unpredictable i know you know people who've drank who've drank before or you may have uh you may consume alcohol as well you know how it makes you feel um you know some people can can control it some people can't 
and then that's when they become unpredictable and volatile. Um, the dark atmosphere can create challenges to seeing, um, and comments and questions can easily be misunderstood. That's why I tell you to ignore what people are telling you unless they're unless you are asking them something that you need a direct answer for. Then I would ignore everything else because you know somebody might say something that wasn't insulting, and you might take it as an insult. And next thing you know. There's barroom fight number two, and you're involved in it. That's not cool. Then I turn you back on patrons. Listen, if you got to go to a hostile bar scene, please call the police. Please don't go on that scene without law enforcement. I can't stress this enough. That's what they're there for. Use them. Do not respond to verbal threats, but recognize the potential for escalation to assault. Um, some people might not want you working on their patient. I'm just telling you, okay? Uh, they hurt them for a reason. They want them to be hurt, and they don't want you doing it. They don't want you helping them, and they might go over there and try to stop it. Okay, back to the case study. Chantel and Dale put on sunglasses to shield their eyes from the late afternoon sun as they start toward the scene. I don't know why that's important, but whatever. Dale turns off the emergency lights and siren two blocks from the scene and then parks at the curb two doors down from the address. He observes that three police cars are on the scene. King, the microphone on the mobile radio, he says, Dispatch Ambulance 5, can you advise if law enforcement has secured the scene? Once they have been advised that the law enforcement has secured the scene, Chantel and Dell exit the ambulance and bring their equipment onto the scene. The crowd is calm, and one of the police officers is kneeling down next to the man lying on the floor. What are the next observations that Dell and Chantel should make? What decision should the crew be prepared to make at this point? Remember, pause and write down these questions so you can go back and look at them and answer them later. Okay. Car passengers. Park at least one car length behind the vehicle with wheels turned slightly to the left. Try to reflect your high beams off the rear view mirror. Write down the license plate number and leave it in the ambulance. And the reason I tell you to do that is because um, if you're dealing with the patient and it turns out they're hostile and they're out there to ambush you and something happens, at least they have a license plate number to track them down and arrest them. I also will advise you that it's a good idea to, as you approach the vehicle, to take your non-gloved hand and press all five fingertips on the back of the car. The reason being is if that car, if that car, if they do something to you and hurt you, that car is located later and they can tie the car to you because they have your fingerprints on the trunk. Nifty, right? Note the number of position, note the number and position of the occupants. Be alert to unseen occupants. Have your partner open the passenger side door first and stay behind the center post. Stay behind the center post because it's thick and it's hard and it may stop bullets literally that's what they're telling you that for if you must retreat back back the vehicle away uh quickly 100 to 150 yards um just just i don't know why you'd be walking up on a vehicle like that but um but may, you never know you never know protect the patient uh protect the patient from the environment and the attention of bystanders if you are unable to control those factors, move the patient to the ambulance. And if the scene is too volatile, you need to contact law enforcement. Protect bystanders. If hazards to the bystanders cannot be eliminated, remove the bystanders from the scene. Um, I don't even know why you need bystanders on the scene anyway unless somebody's giving you a history. So if they're not uh, important to your call, then they need to go anyway. Keeping the crowd out of the way can be challenging. Uh, yes, it can, and it's not your job, so you need to call law enforcement. I'm going to keep saying that. All right, good old picture. Big scene, big crowd. Fire department's there. The police are there. I see one policeman. Everybody else is firefighter EMS. Um... You know, I guess that firefighter right here with his axe is keeping everybody at bay. Sometimes I don't understand these pictures. This guy right here, he's looking over at the camera like, what's going on? Why are you taking a picture? 
that sort of thing. But uh, but anyway, uh, that crowd doesn't look too hostile. They're just trying to see what's going on. It looks like a little fender bender. But and you're like, man, why is there a big crowd out there for just that little wreck? Well, um, it happens. Totally happens. You know, um, Mr. Policeman could have pulled up, could have pulled up right here and blocked everybody from seeing. You know, it just depends, but, uh, you know, it's not my scene, so I don't know what's up, but that's what I would have done. Um, and he's over there by his car when he should be standing in front of that crowd in case they get hostile. But I'm not passing any judgment because I really don't know what's going on there. But that is a scene that has a lot of people and a lot of vehicles, so um, I'm sure it's, it looks like the EMS crew uh, here and one here. This guy's preparing a seat collar, it looks like. This guy's in the back taking manual stabilization and treating patients. So uh, while everybody else is out there doing their thing, trying to keep them safe. All right. All right. Control the scene. Create a workable environment. Make the environment yours to, that you're comfortable working in. You know, um, you got to move things around, move things around. Okay. They can be moved back after you leave. Provide light if it's dark. Uh, you have scene lights on your truck and you turn them on. Lights up the whole scene. You need to carry a flashlight other than a pin light so that you may be able to look, see where you're going, maybe shine a light on something that you need exposed um, because you're like in the yard and there's no street lights or anything. Consider moving furniture. Consider moving the patient. I mean, you got to move the patient out of the way to treat them. Move them. Get them in the truck. Get them somewhere where you can get down there with them and, and do what you got to do, especially if the scene is unsafe. Uh, maintain an escape route. Pay attention to bystanders and anticipate rather than react. Always anticipate. Uh, I'm not saying expect the worst, but expect the worst. All right? If you expect the worst to happen, then if it doesn't, then that's great. But if it does, hey, you were expecting it to happen, and you could probably be prepared for it. Stay calm. Use tact and diplomacy. Tact and diplomacy means tact. You don't speak to people uh, in a degrading manner. You're not rude. You're not. Uh, you're polite with them, even though they're maybe yelling and screaming profanities in your face. Yes, ma'am, and yes, sir, you know, and stuff like that. And sorry, this is still my scene, and you need to leave, but you're being very polite about it, okay? Diplomacy, um, well, you know, diplomacy is where you work out a deal with somebody. Hey, look, I understand you're upset, but I need to work on this patient, and if I can't work on the patient, then they're going to get worse. So I really need you to go sit down over there, and once I'm done, I'll come over there and talk to you and tell you whatever I can tell you. And that's diplomacy. You're giving them something for giving you something, okay? Uh, be flexible. Be fi there's there's no other way to explain that. Be flexible. Be open minded. I mean, look, there are people out there from many walks of life. Okay, whether you agree with them or not, I, there's some walks of life that I don't agree with. But that's not my job. Okay, my job is to go out there and say, hey, this is my patient. They're hurt or they're sick. I need help. Be alert. Be watching things going on. If the scene gets unsafe, you need to try to make it safer. Get out of there. And be compassionate with people. Be compassionate. I dealt with a lady the other day who had been involved in a crash. And she was she had just had back surgery. And she got rear-ended. And her back was hurting. And it was just not it was not very comfortable. How we had her sitting is just the way it was. You know, and um, we couldn't give her enough pain medication to calm her down or to stop the pain. And, uh, and then she starts telling me that, you know, it, within a week's time, no, I'm sorry, within a month's time, she lost her son first and then her husband. And, I mean, that's terrible, you know, and now this happens to her. You got to be compassionate with people, you know. Hey, look, they're going through a lot. Is You're dealing with people on their worst day. You're dealing with people on their worst day, at, you know, at that moment. It's, they're having a bad day. And, and you're there, and you know, the at least you can do is be compassionate, be professional, okay? So that they can at least make their bad day better. Maybe not the best, but better. Maintain situational awareness. Scene size of is dynamic and ongoing. Remain vigilant. I mean, always be checking your surroundings, listen to what people are saying in the background. Maintain scene awareness as well as patient awareness. All right, determine the nature of the problem. The patient's problem may be trauma or medical. Trauma is a physical injury caused by external force. A medical condition is brought on by illness. Dispatch information that starts out on a call 
uh, starts you out on a call, but it could, can be incomplete or inaccurate. Um, I will tell you that as you're headed to a call, that dispatch information is updating every few seconds. As they get it, they're updating, so it's, it's changing. It's dynamic. Uh, mechanism of injury. If I tell you MOI in class, you're going to talk about mechanism of injury. That is what caused the injury. The MOI is how the patient was injured. You need to consider the strength, direction, and nature of forces. Use the mechanism of injury to develop an index of suspicion for specific injuries. Like if someone was ejected from a motor vehicle and hit a tree, uh, well, that's probably going to give you a high level of uh, suspicion of multi-system trauma, multi multiple systems of the body that are injured. Consider dispatch information. Examine the scene. Look at the scene. Look at it. Don't just run up to your patient. You might look at the car and be like, whoa, this is what happened. This is the car looks like this. So I'm, I might look at my patient and think, well, because the car looks like that, my patient's probably going to look have some sort of injury that I need to be aware of. Um, some situations should create a high index of suspicion, like falls, motor vehicle or motorcycle crashes, recreational vehicle crashes, contact or recreational sports, because there could be uh, multiple body systems on your patient that are affected by these types of uh, crashes and, and incidents. Pedestrians struck by vehicles, same, explosions, stabbings or shootings and burns. Falls, we need to be, uh, uh, we need to find out how, how far the patient fell, distance the patient fell, uh, 8 feet, 10 feet, 4 feet, uh, 20 feet. What type of surface did the patient land on? Was it concrete, grass, uh, cotton, you know, keep, <laughs> or whatever, I doubt that's going to be the case, but, you know. What did they fall on? Okay, what body what body part impacted first? Could it have been the arm? Was it the head first? Was it the back? You know that sort of thing. Because usually when we fall, a, one part of our body impacts first, and then the rest follows. Okay. Motor vehicle crashes. The type of impact impact influences injury patterns like head on or frontal collision, rear end collision, side or lateral impact collision, rotational impact collision, and rollovers. Significant impacts uh, that cause deformity to the vehicle greater than 20 inches. That means inside 20 inches inside to the interior of the vehicle. Intrusion um, into the passenger compartment. So wherever the patients were, passengers were sitting, if there's intrusion into that department, then that can be a significant impact. Displacement of a vehicle axle. I mean, those things are hard to displace. And if they're all like cockeyed and whatever, you know, that's probably going to be a big significant crash. You know, rollovers. I mean, you think about being in a car and it rolling over several times. A lot of things are happening. You're striking all parts of the inside of the car. Things are flying all over the place, hitting you, whatever. It could be very, very significant. Impact marks on the windshield caused by the patient's head. Um, you look at the windshield and it's, it's busted. It might not be from uh, the crash from the outside. It might be from the patient's head on the inside. You need to look at the mirror. I mean, the, um, the windshield. A missing rearview mirror. Patient could have hit it. Collapsed steering wheel. That means your patient uh, flew over the steering wheel and bent it. If you've ever tried to push on a steering wheel, they're very hard to bend without uh, with just your own strength. But, you know, being in a vehicle going so many miles per hour, it could collapse that steering wheel. A broken seat. Seats are very hard to break. I'm just telling you, they're very hard to break. So if you find one's broken, you need to be have a high level of suspicion for injury to your patient. Uh, side door damage because your patient was sitting there and that door's pushed in could have struck your patient cracked or smashed dashboard that could be your patient's face hitting that dashboard deformed pedals that's going to give you a high index of suspicion for your patient slamming on the brakes use of restraint devices and deployment of airbags were they using them did the airbags deploy and if they did did it strike your patient that sort of thing Motor vehicle crashes, occupant ejection or death or significant injury of another occupant should increase the suspicion of significant injury. So if you got a, a car that's carrying four people and they get in a head-on collision and one of the patients dies on scene, uh, you need to have a high index of suspicion for the other three patients to have some very significant injuries. Motor vehicle crashes produce some of the most lethal mechanisms of injury. 
That car's pretty mangled up. Airbags are deployed. I see blood on the seat belt. Windows are busted out. Not a good scene. Document the impact type and whether the patient was wearing a helmet. If you uh, are dealing with a motorcycle crash, uh, was it head on, angular impact, ejection, laying the bike down? When I was a sheriff's deputy, I worked a crash on I 10. Um, it was 2 o'clock in the morning, a suburban, a long one of those long Chevrolet Suburbans, was traveling on I 10 eastbound at about 70 miles an hour. She was actually doing 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. All of a sudden, she feels a thud that kind of sends her car into a little swerve. She stops, sees a motorcycle and a body fly past her on the driver's side, and stops. She gets out, looks at it. The driver of the motorcycle has no head. She looks at the back of her vehicle, and the vehicle is uh, crushed in on the A-frame. And all we could um, all we could think that is that the, the motorcyclist was tra traveling so fast such a high rate of speed, and when he hit that uh, rear of that Suburban, now remember that Suburban was doing 70 miles an hour, that it de decapitated him. And uh, we found his head in, still in the helmet, probably almost, I would say almost 50 yards back. So, yep, motorcycle crashes. Recreational vehicle crashes. Rollover and crush injuries are common. Severe impacts with trees, rocks, and other vehicles. Be alert to clothesline injuries. The patient was uh, driving their ATV, didn't see the low-lying uh, low tree limb, smack across the chest, across the face, knock them off. It's like getting clotheslined. I know some of you watched wrestling before and seen the clothesline maneuver. Well, it's just like that, but on a recreational vehicle. Penetrating trauma with calls for shootings or stabbings. Expose, the ass, expose and assess for injuries. Expose unresponsive trauma patients to look for penetrating injury. Log roll to check the posterior body. That means roll them up on their side and check the posterior to make sure there's no other penetrating or exit wounds. There you go. Gunshot wounds or stabbing. Could be the one that is the lateral chest, lateral right side. We are going to put an occlusive dressing on that, a dressing that is taped down on three sides and we're gonna the side right here that's we're not gonna tape this side down because we want it to drain just like it's doing here because we don't want that blood to go in there and we're gonna tape it on this side this side and this side blast injuries injuries may be caused by the pressure wave of the blast flying debris the patient uh, being propelled into the ground or other objects and burns Nature of illness is not a diagnosis. This is for your medical patients that have not been involved in a trauma. Uh, but it, it is an attempt to narrow down the nature of the problem. Um, consider information from dispatch, the patient, family members, and clues at the scene. To determine the nature of illness, consider these clues. The presence of medications, drugs, alcohol, and oxygen. Uh, position the patient, the position and condition of the patient, excuse me, and the environment. All right, determine the number of patients. If there are multiple patients, call for additional help. You only have one ambulance, and you might only have limited seating. And if, if two people need to be on a stretcher, you only have one stretcher. You might need another ambulance. When indicated, activate your multiple casualty incident plan. For multiple patients, perform triage. Okay, case study conclusion. Hi, I'm Dell, and this is Chantel. Dell says to one of the police officers, what happened? Police officer responds that the man lying on the floor was witnessed to have a seizure and fall off his bar stool. I bet you guys were thinking it was a bar fight this whole time. Pulling on exam gloves and kneeling next to the patient, Chantel begins a primary assessment. She quickly determines that the patient is unresponsive but is breathing adequately. Meanwhile, Dell speaks to a friend of the patient's who is able to tell him that the patient has a history of seizures. Bet you thought he was drunk too. The EMTs assess the patient and begin emergency care, staying alert to what is going on on, the on around them. Suspecting both a medical problem and possible trauma from the fall, they take precautions to protect the patient's spine. They determine that the patient first struck his head on an adjacent bar stool, then fell about three feet, landing on his left shoulder. 
The EMTs package the patient for transport, and Dell thanks the police officers for their assistance as they load the patient into the ambulance and begin their trip to the emergency department. Okay, our summary for this lesson is, lesson is scene size up is the initial step in the patient assessment. The scene size up is an initial evaluation of the scene, the goals of which are to ensure safety of those at the scene, determine the nature of the problem, determine the need for additional resources, and take the necessary PPE precautions. All right, we will see you next time.